Uh, so I might make a start. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's uh, quite overwhelming to see the number of people who've uh, turned up for my talk. So um, thank you very much. But I think it's, um, it proves that uh, from some of the discussions I'd had yesterday, I was very fortunate to meet a couple of people at the Business Summit. And um, it seems that uh, this concept of self-organisation is actually something that um, a lot of people in the Drupal community and people who um, work, work uh, in Drupal projects are, are quite interested in. And um, it's obviously a very core part of uh, what we do, both um, as a community and uh, on the projects that, that we work on in Drupal. So um, just to get started, uh, my name is Jason Coglin. Um, I'm currently the Client Services Director at uh, Previous Next. And I've come from Sydney, Australia to be here at DrupalCon this year. Um, we, um, we're a, a, a specialised or specialist Drupal company in Australia. We, we only do Drupal development. Um, we provide a lot of uh, services based, um, uh, well, we provide Drupal services, but we also um, do a lot of contribution to the community and uh, a lot of our development team are, are core contributors to Drupal. So um, it's something that we're obviously all very passionate about and um, I think we have, there's six of us here at, at, at DrupalCon this year. Uh, so. Just a bit of background about me and where I got to, uh, how I got to this point. Um, I've been working in project management for about 15 years uh, in the online space, and sort of prior to uh, starting to work on the uh, the internet, internet machine, I um, was uh, was in uh, the field of engineering, working on some fairly large scale construction projects, and um, I think that that drove probably the the first part of my project management career. Um, in that it was a very rigid command and control type approach with uh, great attention to detail and uh, essentially I was the one who, who ran the show. Um, now, I've certainly evolved from that point and learnt um, over the last five years since I, I started working in, in a more agile way that um, that approach, uh, especially given what we do, is, is fundamentally wrong. And um, so I consider myself a... Um, a very strong convert to, to the Agile way. And um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot more recently is this concept of self-organisation. So um, it's, it's what's uh, behind my talk today. And, um, and, and I consider this something that is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just beginning really to think about and, and get, a, get a good grasp on. So um, I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear other people's uh, thoughts and opinions um, around this. Um, so I think one of the key things I realised, even reflecting on the, um, my, my time as, as sort of a, a waterfall-style project manager, was that the, key, the two key things that really drove uh, the way that I, I worked and, and the projects that I ran was all around communication and uh, also around a creative approach to, to project management. So whilst it was a very top-down, um, requirements-driven uh, very specific uh, sign-off sort of processes and, and moving straight into building um, what we were doing, uh, it, it was still along the way there was a lot of adjustment that went on and a lot of creative kind of approaches to, to, to getting the project to the end, even though it was, it was that, that waterfall um, style approach. Um, so what I've learned uh, is that uh, that's a fairly old school way of doing things and the the Certainly the push is, is very much towards an agile approach and somewhere in the middle of those two um, I think lies the sort of probably not perfect solution but certainly the approach that, um, that is, is the most effective for running not, not just Drupal projects but, um, but, but any kind of uh, digital type project or product development in, in, in the software space. So I mean at the heart of it all I think it's, it's all about the right people um, and then their ability to self-organise. And, and today I'm going to talk a little, about, a little bit about um, the factors that, that influence um, us being able to, to self-organise. So um, why, is, why are meerkats um, part of my talk? Well, um, apart from the fact I suppose they're, uh, they're quite cute and they're an amusing animal, um, they... They, they demonstrate um, a, a great deal of altruistic behaviour in, in the way that they work um, together. And they also share what's called like a sentry duty where a, a number of um, the meerkats in the group will actually look out for the rest of, of the group. Um, but as I discovered, as I uh, did some more reading about 
meerkats and their behaviour, I found out there was a little bit more to it than just that. So the comparisons uh, are quite strong. So they, they, they work in large community groups together. Um, so as, as we talked about before, there's, uh, a few of them will work as lookouts to, make, to, to uh, um, look out for impending danger and um, protect the rest of the group from, from that. Um, they have a various network of burrows that they move between and, uh, and, and adapt to the different environments in which they're working. Um, they've uh, developed a special adaptation whereby they uh, can close their ears when they burrow and no dirt will get in so they, they can uh, shield themselves from any distractions. Um, the one thing is that they, they need the early morning sun to get going and, uh, and as, as the day begins they need uh, a certain amount of stimulus and uh, uh, what, what they can only tolerate short bursts of activity during the day, during the morning and then in the afternoon. Um, they have a wide and varied diet and they've certainly developed an ability to consume dangerous foods. They even have the ability to take on poisonous scorpions and, and have them for their dinner. So um, one of the key things that made me discover that they're not particularly um, as cute and, and, and friendly as they might appear is that they do have, um, they demonstrate a lot of alpha behaviour and, uh, and, and there's alpha pairs within the group um, that uh, reserve the right to be the ones to rule and they're the ones who, who actually uh, reserve the right to reproduce. And they'll, uh, they'll quite readily kill um, any of the, the young of their subordinates um, in, in order for their own to have a better chance of survival. So um, they're, uh, they're essentially not really as uh, cute and cuddly as, uh, as, as they might appear. Um, so one thing I just wanted to uh, say before I get right into the presentation is that I, want, uh, I would like this, if, if, um, if everyone's willing, to, to be a bit more participative sort of uh, um, presentation. Um, certainly contribute your thoughts and um, ask any questions at any time throughout the, the presentation. Um, I, it doesn't need to be at the end. If there's anything that <coughs> triggers a thought or a comment that you'd like to make or share with the group, then feel, feel free to do so. Um, I'd also like to propose continuing this conversation because I've... I've I've seen that it's certainly uh, something that people are interested in just from the conversations that I've had and um, beyond the presentation today, um, I'd like to even look at starting uh, as some sort of a community research project um, th that, that focuses on the Drupal community um, because it's generally what we're all most interested in and, um, and, and, and see where we go from there. So I've, I've organised a, a BOF, which is actually uh, tomorrow morning, so if anyone's interested to come along, it's at uh, 10.45 so we can have uh, more of a conversation than me just uh, standing up here and, and talking at you. So um, one thing I, I'd like to do to, to initiate that uh, discussion is um, I've put some post-it notes there on that table and the one at the back. So if anyone would like to grab one, um, what I'd like to do is start by getting uh, a sense of the one key problem that everybody has uh, on their Drupal projects and the one thing that they'd really like to, to try and solve whether it relates to the concept of self-organisation, it um, doesn't matter. It's just looking at uh, the, the key problems that, that we experience on, on our Drupal projects. So um, what I'm going to look at um, today is, is the key factors and influences that relate to, to self-organisation and, and how um, a team can actually uh, self-organise. So there's... there's a number of factors at play here. There's uh, organisational um, factors, so the, 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 the attributes of a business or the way that a business is structured um, that allows it to be more, more suited to um, self-organisation is not the easiest thing for, for a very traditional um, company with traditional uh, project management approaches to actually get to that point. I certainly um, will vouch for that given the, the number of years that it's taken me to, personally to just to get to this point of... Uh, of, of really truly understanding what Agile is all about and what, what the, the kind of core um, uh, aspects to uh, Agile are to, to be successful. So um, looking at um, also how clients, so commercial factors, so how, how clients and customers actually influence this project, they can have a, a huge impact on uh, the way that, uh, or the success of, of you um, creating a, a, a very well functioning agile environment and having a, a very strong uh, self organizing team so uh, the final thing really is um, or also looking at the types of projects and the methodologies and processes that um, are most suited to self organization um, i won 't be spending a lot of time looking at those um, 
because I think one of the, 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 key, the key factors in all of this is, is about the people and about the roles that people take on and adopt um, in, in a self-organising team. So um, what is self-organisation? So self-organisation actually stems um, very strongly from uh, a scientific principle and it is a natural process. It's a, it's a naturally occurring process and I think that's one of the really fascinating things about self-organisation is uh, and looking at it in the context of what we do and the context of a, 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 of a team is that it, it's, it's natural. It's something that comes naturally to it, to us and, and generally in nature. Um, and, it, and it's totally uh, sort of contradictory to the way that we have um, previously approached projects and also the way that we've structured, um, structured businesses. Um, so this, th this sort of is, is a great quote. It comes from um, the concept of chaos theory and it, and it, I think, quite adequately describes the sort of environment um, that you feel you can be working in at times on, on the projects that we do. Um, the idea of self-organisation is that y you have a state of non-equilibrium or as in uh, chaos theory, you, you have a chaotic environment and um, through, through this sort of dynamic and interaction of, and feedback within the system itself, you, you, you move more towards a state of equilibrium. Uh, so. Um, it's, it's really about that uh, exploration and exploitation of the information that is generated or the stimulus that's happening within a system that, that leads a system towards uh, a greater order. And, and this applies actually across a number of different systems. The one, uh, there's one, one particular type of system we'll talk about today, but it's, it's in physics, it's in chemistry, it's in biology. I'd, um, anyone who's interested in that side of things, um, I'd, I'd, I'd look it up. It's, uh, it's quite fascinating. Uh, so, just just in looking at that, um, some of the, uh, the, the this sort of is just a visual way of, of um, describing that or understanding that you have entropy or what's a chaotic uh, system, and then we're moving more towards a, a much more structured system. So, um, one one um, one example of this in uh, probably close, most closely represents what we do, and and even Drupal itself is um, that. The, the concept of, of um, a product or a platform is that once more people start using that particular um, product or service or platform, um, the greater the value of that platform or, or service um, becomes. So there's a, a lot of local connections that are made and rapidly uh, as more people join that, uh, that, that and make those connections within the network, it um, it, it, it creates more positive outcomes and we move uh, to something of, of, of much higher value. So um, it, it's, a, it's proof that the, the kind of synergy between um, uh, elements within this system, so in this case it's, it's people in a, in a social, um, social media context or um, I don't really want to use Facebook as the example, but um, you, can, you can look at this as, uh, as an example of how Drupal has evolved as well in that the, the more... The, the more that people interact and the more inputs that, um, that happen, the, the, the greater that system becomes. So within nature, a really good example of self-organisation is actually ant colonies. And they're governed by very simple rules, um, uh, but exhibit and create these very complex structures and, and, and quite complex behaviour. So then it, it's, a, it's a completely decentralised structure and a very, very good example of a self-organising system. So... The, the queen in, a, in an ant colony does not tell the other ants what to do. They uh, respond to a, an external, external stimuli, which is a, a, chemical, um, a chemical stimuli from, from other ants, and the, the organisation is distributed throughout the whole system, and, and then all parts of the system uh, contribute equally to that, and then there's a resulting arrangement, which is, is what we see as an ant colony. So um, how this... Uh, in, in the context of what we do and what I was, I was talking about before in terms of traditional structures, this is the sort of thing that you would see in uh, many businesses, the very top-down um, hierarchical kind of approach to business. Um, you could also apply this to a project and it's dependent on a single coordinator. So there really uh, could be considered to be a, a single point of failure in, in a system like this. 
So what we want to try and achieve is something that looks a lot more like this. So it's a much more resilient model um, and it's a lot more robust because of the distributed dependencies within the system. So there, there is no single point of failure and uh, if, if you do remove one element from, from this system, um, it, it has the ability to, to self-repair to some degree. So um, self-organising teams. So um, we've talked a little bit about the application to business and what we do, and I'm just going to go into a little bit more um, detail about that now. So self-organising teams. Some people might consider this as what a self-organising team is. Um, it, it's certainly not uh, agile uh, as a project methodology. is not something that... Uh, businesses take on readily and the concept of a self trying to describe what a self-organising team is and how you would take an agile approach to a project, um, both within the sort of senior management structures of a company or within um, uh, to, or to a customer is sometimes a very difficult sell and a very difficult thing for them to grasp. Um, and the, they, they would potentially look at it as, as something like this. So, um, Self-organising teams, or the concept of self-organisation, is actually, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Agile, you will know this already, but it is, it's built into the principles of, of Agile. Um, this is one of the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto, um, which of course is kind of the, the governing um, manifesto or guiding principles that um, drive a lot of uh, Agile methodologies like, like Scrum, for instance. So, um, built into that, it is considered, and I mentioned this before, it's, it's considered um, a human-based system or one where there's an uh, interaction uh, where, where we're generating information and processing that information to, in, in order for us to, to make decisions and, and, uh, and evolve a product or evolve on, on, a, on a project. Um, it, it's considered a cognitive system, and that's one where um, there's a generation of information and um, that information that's generated within a system, uh, within, in a chaotic environment, um, provides us with a very wide spectrum of options um, in order for us to uh, make the decisions that we do. So the, um, the, the thing that helps us to form order in that, in that context is our ability to process that, um, what, what is semantic information and, um, and, and actually understand and interpret the actual meaning of that information so that we can then um, make, make decisions and uh, perceive that information and, and then act on that in, in a way that uh, achieves, a, uh, achieves a decision or um, uh, look, has, has us go down a, a certain path um, when, we're, when, we're, when, we're, when we're developing. So, the, um, uh, so from, from the information that's generated, a new meaning um, is formed um, when, when there's a different perspective on that or a new point of view um, provides a greater dimension to the to the organisation and the organisation within a team itself. So that's the way that we we actually manage that information, um, and that is not always an inevitable outcome of this this process that I'm trying to describe there. Uh, so self organisation is not something that just happens, and we don't um, we, we start with a with a chaotic environment. We start with a, a, a sense of chaos. Um, moving towards order, but that's not always the way. There are um, actual other influences that we'll talk about in a moment that, that are very important towards uh, that becoming a more ordered and um, structured uh, um, environment and, and not one that remains in kind of a state of chaos. So um, what, there's, there's a number of attributes that would need to be, um, need to be present and a number of influencing factors that, that need to be present for a self-organising team to actually be to be successful, so those are that um, the team should be autonomous. And coming back to um, that concept before of of, uh, of a self-organising structure within a business, um, again, that's something that's difficult to sell or difficult sometimes for um, uh, management structures within a business to actually uh, to understand and to and, and to be willing to 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 let a team be uh, more autonomous than. Than, than they would normally uh, expect them to be. 
Um, the team itself would, needs to have a common focus. So um, it's not a matter of just throwing people together and hoping for the best. Um, there needs to be a really you know, strong driver behind what it is that they're doing and they all need to have a clear understanding of what, where they're trying to get to. Um, and then there's this concept, of course, within self-organisation of distributed leadership. And um, not all members of the team need to become a leader as such uh, or adopt a true uh, leadership role. Um, but there are uh, stages throughout a project or, or at points at which um, everyone within, it, within a self-organising team can exhibit or undertake a, a position of leadership. Um, so it's, uh, it's that the, um, at a, it can happen at a, at a high level, so um, somebody just providing that direction and, and guidance um, to the team um, in order for them to, to keep moving and to keep self-organising, or it might happen at a lot lower level in the team where somebody uh, ex exhibits a um, leadership on a decision that needs to be made regarding a critical piece of functionality or a, um, or a, some kind of um, a decision that needs to be made in order for the, for the architecture of the system to, be, uh, to, to achieve a good outcome. Um, so the, an, another a really important factor is, is this idea of dynamic adjustment and adaptation. So everybody in the team obviously needs to be willing to change and adapt to that change and make any necessary adjustments that they need to, to achieve the outcome that uh, that we want to do, and the going back to the idea of chaos and and, and the whole um, driving force behind these things happening is that there are going to be chaotic acts and there's going to be um, chaotic events within uh, any kind of project or any self-organising team, and and that team needs to, to to be willing and flexible enough to be able to adapt um, in that in that um, situation, and then finally. Uh, there needs to be a very strong ability to elicit requirements um, when working on a project. So when we're looking at the development of a pr proposed solution, um, there needs to be a strong sense of, of how something should function based on the, the inputs of information that we, we're getting from, from the customer or the client or from, from other sources. So um, the... Uh, very, sorry. So the next thing I wanted to, to talk about is how, um, how can a business be more ready to actually take on this approach and uh, whether it be adopting Agile as, as the way to manage their projects or whether it be um, simply that they, they, they need to get better at that, um, at what they're doing in that, in that, in that way and, um, and have more self-organising teams or a greater sense of self-organisation within within their teams. Um, this is a, another really interesting um, quote that I came across that um, it is a very good example of why uh, it, the, the top-down hierarchical kind of environment is really not conducive to, to innovation or to us actually uh, undertaking projects that have, have a really high value outcome um, for either for us as a community with, with Drupal or for a, a project we're working on. Um, the bureaucracy, as you say, is bureaucracy represents an organisation for which chaos has been completely eliminated. Now, to some people, that actually might be a good thing. People who uh, are uncomfortable with change or just want things to be very predictable on a daily basis. Um, but what's going to happen is what could be termed orderly idleness. And... And, and you're never actually going to achieve innovation or uh, adapt to change or, or really, as I said before, achieve a, a really high value outcome um, on, on the project that you're working on. So the organisation, organisational environment um, is, is very important. So if a business is not willing to adopt this kind of theory or adopt an agile approach or even get their head around um, the, the idea of self-organisation, they're going to struggle. Uh, w with this with this approach, so the command and control um, approach versus a distributed kind of leadership and management um, is is the thing that needs to be looked at um, looked at most closely. So um, any transition from what is that bureau bureaucratic kind of environment to a uh, to a more kind of indiv individual 
individualistic kind of envir environment or one that focuses on um, people being autonomous and, and, and allowed to, to work in this kind of self-organising structure um, can be very challenging, um, can be extremely disruptive. Um, it certainly, as I mentioned before, it kind of plays on a lot of the insecurities that people have uh, in, in traditional business and in traditional business, business structures. And, and certainly you can find that um, in any kind of uh, transitional period in doing this thing, people will get very defensive about uh, you know, the sort of things that you're proposing or the, 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 the approach in general. So um, I guess in order to sort of uh, relay my own experience on that one, um, I would say that the first time I took on an Agile project as a traditional waterfall type project manager, um, it was very, very confronting and very difficult. Um, I think back to when I first moved from an engineering um, engineering career to, to a, a, what is essentially kind of a, a web development or software development uh, environment. It was very early days in, um, in the web space and, and I found that very confronting at the time. Um, and, but, but now I reflect on that, I see that that was actually the, the start of this sort of journey that I've come on to get me to the point where I now truly understand that kind of chaotic environment that I was thrown into because it was certainly very chaotic um, just 15 years ago. Nobody actually really knew what they were doing. They were just kind of making it up as they went along. Um, we've moved into a much more kind of mature um, environment to work in now. And like I said, reflecting on that, I now see that they were the kind of the seeds of change um, that were being sown right back then for me to now really understand why it's important to take this kind of agile or self-organising approach to um, the sort of things we do because they are chaotic, they are, they are unpredictable, they're probably more predictable than they used to be, um, but they certainly, they, it certainly requires a fairly unique approach. Uh, so when I, was, when I was making that initial um, transition, uh, the things I found that were the, the most difficult was that no one in, in, the, in the mix had, were, were really at all um, cooperating or understanding or, or looking at it, um, uh, like I said before, that n there wasn't a, a, a really um, cooperative type um, approach to it. The, the team who was working, uh, the development team, essentially looked at it as a license to just do whatever they liked and spend however much time they wanted to on anything and just look at it as a, a big grand experiment, even though there was, there was sort of fairly loose requirements to start with at the beginning. The customer, had no concept of the idea, uh, had no concept of Agile, had no concept of what we were trying to achieve there. We were just sort of thrown into an Agile environment and told to work in that fashion. So it was great for the developers because they, uh, a lot of them were, uh, came from sort of a product development background and had some familiar, familiarity with it, but saw that opportunity um, to just essentially go and experiment because they realised that no one else really knew what was going on. Um, and then, the, so the customer takes this approach of, well, it's fixed price, fixed costs, you know, you're going to deliver this thing and we're just going to go away and we'll come back in six months and it'll all be great, um, which of course it wasn't. And then the um, senior management within the organisation that, that we were doing this project with just were completely hands off, had no concept of what Agile was about and really no interest in in trying to bridge that gap between the customer and the team and, and make sure that uh, they were engaged and, and that we were working as, a, as, as one big unit. So the self-organising team needed to include not just the development team or the project um, managers within that sort of environment, it needed to in include the customer and also the management of the company. So uh, really at the end of the day, the whole thing was just a complete debacle. Um, so rather than sort of run screaming back to the traditional waterfall approach, um, it, it certainly was a great lesson in what, how to do it better and what can go wrong because this is probably the worst possible example of, of it. But it was, it was some, if, I mean, what I'd like to say is that if anyone finds themselves in that environment coming from that more traditional old school type approach and background, I would, I would strongly um, suggest persisting with it because it's well worth it and it, it was a, a, very good, a very good learning experience. So... Um, what are the influencing factors um, that, uh, that, that make an organisation um, more ready to do this and, um, and, and the sort of, uh, sort of behaviours that need to go on to, to, um, to make sure that this does occur? Well, it's across the board with um, everyone I just mentioned before from the development team right through to the, the, the client. Um, 
there's, there should be just a, a very subtle element of control and direction, and everybody needs to understand that. Um, the customer, the senior management of the company, um, project managers within the team who may have come from a more waterfall background, it is not about command and control. Um, it's a lot about um, facilitation, and those people who do have a, a, a greater leadership role within the project need to be there to facilitate, not to, not to direct. Uh, then the idea is that you really need to relinquish a level of control. So those things I was just talking about then, it is, it is about relinquishing control and people who have um, come from that um, or, or come from that approach where they are in control, um, it, can be, it can be a difficult thing for them to grasp. So, um, and again, back to the whole idea of, of senior management, that they're, they're critical to, um, to being able to facilitate this um, this whole idea in the first place, to, to allow um, teams to work in this fashion and to under, understand exactly the benefits of it and what's going to be, what the outcomes are going to be. And it, some of the research that I've been doing um, prior to, uh, to, to my talk today has been looking at um, various models and businesses that are very successful at this. And one thing um, which I'd recommend anybody who's interested in do some more reading on is um, uh, Japanese business models uh, are a very, a very good source of understanding and um, seeing how success, uh, you can achieve a very high level of success to take an approach like this. And one of the, one of the most um, interesting things that I read was around a, a, a CEO of a Japanese company who'd been there for, for many, many years and just decided to resign one day and everyone was shocked with, with, with the decision. And the, the, the specific reason that was given for, for him uh, resigning on that particular day was that he said that he got to the point where um, more than 70% of the company um, agreed with him and agreed with the things and the decisions that he was making. So he just felt that that was just way too many people to be agreeing with him and that it was a much better situation for the company when the majority of the, of the company didn't agree with his decisions and were constantly challenging, um, challenging the, the decisions that were being made. So this is, again, this is a really good way to look at it. So, um, I mean, uh, every, every kind of... Uh, Every kind of comedy you ever see about um, office life or businesses, it's always poking fun at managers and middle managers and, and, and you know, how superfluous they are to the whole process. Well, I think this kind of sums that up, and that is that, that you know, leadership is incredibly important in this whole process, and it's not just about people in senior positions within a company that need to exhibit that sort of leadership, and leadership is, is really at the core of, of all of this. Um, so commercial factors. So I mentioned, I've, I've kind of touched on this before and I won't spend too much time on it, but um, this idea of it's all about, all about the customer, well, I mean, it is all about the customer um, to some degree. Um, it's probably a bit more of a salesy marketing type uh, idea around it, but in this context, it is about them uh, in a very, uh, it is, they are a very important factor in this because if they're not willing to uh, take this approach and they're not willing to engage and understand what it is that you're trying to achieve here, um, then it, it really is it really is setting itself uh, you're setting yourself up to fail. I mean, it's crucial to the success of a project. And if a cup, if the client that you're working with is not fully engaged in this whole process, it, it's a complete hindrance to to the success of um, of, of the project. Uh, so so what I've mentioned there is. Um, one way to mitigate that or, and, and, and try and ensure that you can achieve a better outcome is, is through education and support of a client. So um, in, an agile, um, in an agile project, um, the methodology there is, is that you really uh, want to um, have a strong product owner in, in an agile project and you can't just stand back and uh, sort of tell the tell the client they've got to come up with all the requirements and write all of the user stories and get everything perfect and then the team will start having a look at it when they're done with that. That just never happens. Well, in my experience, it never happens. And one thing that we've, um, we've done um, at, at Previous Next is that we are really focusing on having um, advocates within our, our team, mainly our, our sort of more project management style people, uh, 
focusing very strongly on being advocates for the client and educating and supporting them through the process to understand what it's all about to, to work in an agile environment and understand what this whole concept of self-organisation is and how important their involvement in the process, every step of the process is. Um, so what sort of projects or products um, lend themselves to this? I was having a discussion about this yesterday. Um, my opinion when I was putting this presentation together was, was that this, this sort of approach really only applies or works within a, a technology-driven or software-driven type um, project. Uh, one where it's, it's dynamic, uh, there's, there's, the, um, there's the, the ability to make mistakes and uh, adapt to change as you go, uh, evolving requirements, those kind of things. I still strongly believe that. Um, but I think it's an area where a lot more research could go into this concept, again, of self-organisation and how it could apply more broadly across other projects. The thing that I used as an example was you wouldn't do this if you're building a bridge or you're building a large-scale large, uh, large scale building somewhere. Everything has to be millimetre perfect. You need to be in control and looking at the detail every step of the way or someone's going to get hurt. That doesn't happen um, on our projects. We make a mistake, there is a bug in the software, so something doesn't happen correctly when you go live with the website, it, everything goes pear-shaped, well, no one really gets hurt. So we, we have that luxury to be able to do this and, and be a bit more experimental in, in our approach. So, um, but I'm still very interested to, to get a better understanding more broadly as to whether or not um, you know, there are other, there are other uh, industries and, and projects this could this could apply to. Uh, so methodology and process. So what, what approach works or um, where does self-organisation fit in to um, project management methodology? Well, it, kinda, it, it comes down to a waterfall versus agile approach. And I, I did say before that um, coming from a waterfall background, I feel like I've put that behind me and I don't want to borrow it ever again and that self-organisation has no place in waterfall. Well, I kind of, I'd kind of like to be challenged on that and, and look at that as, um, uh, as something, as a topic of discussion, because I, I do believe that you can't just outright dismiss the waterfall approach. People are still going to do it. A lot of, it's going to take a long time for Agile really to sort of filter through and become you know, the only way that, that everybody works um, in, this, in this space. And that's, that's probably a bit of a utopian view. I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, but, you know, I, I, there's probably elements of self-organisation that could be applied in a waterfall context, and I'd be really interested to know um, or explore how, how that could work. But clearly, Agile is the way to go, and, you know, Agile is... and uh, self-organisation is at the core of, of Agile itself. So that really is um, the right approach to be taking um, if you're doing that. So there's obviously very various flavours of Agile. Um, the one that uh, I'm most experienced with is, is the Scrum-based approach, and, uh, and, and that is, is certainly working very well for us. Um, we've made a lot of mistakes with it. We're still adjusting. Um, but again, that's really the nature of this. It's the nature of Agile is that you adapt and change. And, and again, some of the conversations I had yesterday, it's really interesting. We, you start uh, companies or businesses start to take on Agile, choose a particular flavour of Agile, and you know that five years down the track, they're, they're not doing anything like they did right back at the beginning, even though they actually um, are, are using the same methodology and the same processes. The way that they're doing it is completely different. So it, it's all about that adaptation and change right throughout. Um, I've got a few notes there about Scrum, but I think it, it, those of you who know Agile will be familiar with Scrum. If you're not, um, I'd recommend going, going away and having um, a bit of a look at, at that as an approach if you're interested in that. Um, so I've listed this one to last because this really is um, the most critical um, factor in all of self-organisation, and that's all about the people. So these are the elements of the system um, that are going to most greatly influence the outcome at the end. So there's a number of things to, to address when it comes to the behavioural inf influences on self-organisation. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll just run through quickly are roles. Now this comes out of a, a piece of research that I'd read, um, which really struck a chord when, uh, when I was preparing my talk. 
because this this is a really um, a really well done piece of research and a really good way for people to uh, get their head around how self organisation works and what what um, what the the roles are of people in that. So there's um, there's six different roles that people will take on in a self organising team, and that doesn't mean it's six different people. Uh, it could be one person doing four of these roles at any one time or on any one day. Um, it could be a number of other people. So, uh, there, but there's also the concept that the people within a self-organising team may not take on any of these roles at any point in time. Um, so the first one is the idea of a mentor. So the, the mentor guides and supports um, the team in the initial stages of this, and they, they help the team to become confident in the in the process, the agile methodology and, and the processes that they're doing. So they they then monitor and encourage the team throughout the whole project to actually um, to, to adhere to the practices of agile and make sure that they're, they're kind of sticking to the sticking to the plan. Um, this th this role is probably most traditionally uh, undertaken or adopted by a scrum master or a coach, agile coach. Uh, but that's not to say that anyone um, couldn't step up at any point in the project and do this. I know from our own experience at Previous Next, everyone in our team um, has gone through a Scrum Master training, so we're of the view that at any one point in time, if we really needed to, um, any member of the team could step up and act in that particular role and, and, and even undertake this kind of mentoring type role. Again, I think you know, we're going through a strong period of evolution with the way that we're approaching this, whether or not we have developers working as Scrum Masters or we have project management um, professionals working as Scrum Masters. Um, it, it's, again, it's, it's, it's a good example of that sort of uh, constantly evolving model. Um, the second role is the one of the coordinator. So this, this person acts as a representative of the, um, the team to, to coordinate and communicate uh, the change requests, we want to refer to them as change requests, that come through from the customer or the client. So um, that person interacts with both the team and the customer themselves. And this, this role um, is not really like a scrum master type role or a project management type role. This is, this is the developer. This, this is a developer in the team. Or if, if you have business analysts, um, it, it would be somebody like that taking and in, in interpreting uh, not necessarily interpreting the requirements, but coordinating that process of, of, of bringing in those requests. Then there's the translator. So the translator um, is the person that really understands the requirement best. They're able to take take it in, uh, take a requirement in business, uh, in business language used by the customers, and then translate that into technical terminology for the team. So they're again interacting with the team and the customer, and most likely this um, this this person is, is, is someone with business analyst type um, skills. Then there's the champion. So the champion, um, they, they champion the agile cause and um, they're doing that to the senior management within the company that's running the project. So they're constantly uh, reminding senior management or um, uh, gaining their support for, for the concept of having a self-organizing team or running projects in an agile way. Um, again, this person is probably most likely somebody like a Scrum Master. Then there's the promoter. So the promoter is the one who does that with the customer. So um, they attempt to secure their involvement in the whole process and um, collaborate and support with them to in, in, ensure that the, the team can, can function effectively. And, and as I said, they, they interact with the customer only. And again, this is probably a Scrum Master type role. So you can see as I mentioned before, these roles, there's multiple roles and they can be taken on by one person or they, they, they can uh, be taken on by anyone in the team really if they have the capability or the desire to do so. This is my favourite one, the Terminator. So, <laughs> who you got a question? Yes. Right. Oh, well, we, we, um, we definitely would have that um, that role to um, probably more from a, a methodology point of view and, and talking to them about what we're doing and how we're running okay. Scrum, more so than actually requirements gathering or um, interpreting or translating, like I mentioned before. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is, this is my favorite one. So 
what this role is, uh, is quite a brutal one, and that is this, this is the person or in this role, they, they identify people who are disruptive to the team and they remove them from the team. And the way they do that is they engage the support of senior management or whoever can make that decision and they remove them. Because if people are not operating effectively within the team or they are disruptive, then it is going to affect that whole, uh, whole system. Again, I mentioned before, this could be anyone, really. Uh, anyone who wants to put their hand up and say, this person is, uh, is, is killing us. So um, just to quickly wrap up there, there's a number of um, other things. There's, so there's, there's the number of roles, but then there's the actual people and the disciplines that uh, those, those roles apply to. So there's developers, there's business analysts, there's um, coaches or scrum masters. And um, that coach or scrum master type role, as those of you who know Agile will be familiar with, it's kind of a little bit, you could use the analogy of a sports type, a sports coach where they set direction, they align the people, um, obtain, obtain certain resources and then motivate the team to, to, um, to, to achieve the best outcome they can. Um, the sort of personalities that you want to have, this would apply to anybody in the team. Um, people who can manage their own workload, um, people who are good at decision making, people who are collaborative, um, people who are trusting and respectful of the other people that they're working with, and, uh, and finally, the people who are willing just to participate, so not people who are gonna, just going to sit back and wait for things to land on their desk and, and uh, just um, bang away at the keyboard. Um, and then there's the wrong people, so this is where the Terminator comes into it. The wrong sort of people are those who have that inability to adapt to this type of environment. If they're not willing to change, they're not willing to adapt to this type of model, they just shouldn't be there. It's not going to work. Um, interestingly, the other end of the spectrum, people who are very idealistic and evangelical about Agile, because it happens. You send somebody on an Agile course, they have this major epiphany, and they come back, and they're just, you know, every, you know that's not right. You should have this, you know, um, scrums need to to happen at this time every day. They need, we need to do sprints, they all need to be two weeks, they can't be one week. And so you'll get these people and they'll just, they are completely um, insane. And that is actually a really destabilizing factor. And so it, it's kind of, it, it seems a bit contradictory, but the people who won't change and the people who just you know, go crazy about it, you, both of those people are bad. Um, so one thing I've mentioned there, and this is something that I'm not going to cover off today, but it's something that I'd really like to explore a little bit more about, and anybody who's interested in coming to the BOF, um, maybe it's something we could discuss, um, is recruitment. How do you recruit for this? So, I mean, we use a number of tools and techniques and even online um, testing and uh, that kind of thing to, to, to look for the right people. Um, what we haven't been doing, though, is actually looking, that, looking at that and relating it back to some of the things that I've mentioned, so the, the concept of... Um, uh, those roles and how people would fit and those sort of personalities. But we certainly, I think we get a good feel for that anyway from the sort of culture and environment that we've fostered in our own company. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm running a little bit over time here. But um, just to, just to, uh, just to summarise what I've been through today. So um, the theory of self-organisation, how it applies in the nature and human systems. Again, I think it's a really fascinating thing. So anybody who's interested, I'd recommend going away and having, having a little, spending a bit of time Googling about it. It's, it's quite, a, quite an interesting topic. Um, and the factors and influences are, that, that are really important to consider when um, you're looking at self-organising team. Um, of course, it's, it's actually understanding the concept in the first place. So I think looking at some of the theoretical stuff can really help. Um, some of the more amusing stuff around ant colonies or whatever other swarming kind of behaviour you'll see in nature, I think is a really good thing, a really good way to describe it to people. Uh, organisational factors, we went through commercial factors to do with the customer and then most importantly the people and all of those roles that are really important um, to be at play in, in your project. Um, so finally, does it work? Uh, well, I mean, for me, the answer to that is clearly yes, it, it works and it's a much more effective way um, than, than any other approach that I've, I've taken in the past or I've seen other people take in the, in the past. Um, Agile is, is, is definitely... Um, a, a great way to go for Drupal projects. Um, uh, focusing in on the, the self-organisation capabilities of the teams, again, I think that's something that's just really critically important to this whole thing, but also making sure that you're doing that in the right way and those roles are all being fulfilled and people are, are, being, uh, are being educated and um, supported in doing this. And so um, 
So my answer is yes, but I, I mean, I am not professing to be the expert on this topic. It's something I'm really just starting to explore. I'm very interested in, in researching it further, and certainly um, anyone else who's interested in contributing it, so contributing to that. So discussing, exploring, and researching this thing is, um, is something I'd, I'd, I'd like to hopefully be a catalyst for, and certainly something I'd strongly encourage other people to do if they're interested. Uh, so there's more to think about. Uh, so just to remind you again, I've organised a BOF for tomorrow, so anyone else who wants to come and actually have a chat about this in a little bit more depth, um, throw their own opinions around instead of just listening to mine, um, please come along. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So please, uh, please uh, jump on there and uh, let me know what you think. That would be uh, most appreciated. Um, but if there's uh, any questions or anything anybody wants to, um, to talk about, we've got about 10 minutes left. Yes? Uh, look, I probably wasn't suggesting. I wasn't suggesting. So um, the question is, um, w do we immediately terminate people just because they're not um, they're not adhering to the process or, or participating in in in, a, in the way that we'd want? Um, no, I wouldn't be suggesting that immediately people just get kicked out. I think if you can um, spend some time and and remind people or go back or, um, for want of a better term, re-educate them on. Uh, on the on the best way to approach this thing, then absolutely. I think that's a last resort. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, you mentioned uh, that there is uh, there can be some alpha alpha struggle going on. Yes. And there's also this mentor. Yep. You have uh, somebody mentoring somebody else. There can sometimes be a conflict there where you have uh, you know, somebody who's actually supposed to be mentoring but who's also you know, actually stopping uh, this uh, development within the team. Have you got any experience with how, how to deal with that? Which uh, can eventually become very unadaptable. Yeah, well, I don't think if somebody's uh, in a mentoring type role, they shouldn't be uh, disruptive. Uh, that they're the wrong person for that that type of role. If that's if that's what's happening, um, the reference to the alpha behaviour, I think, is just the nature of the kind of it's the nature of the industry. It's the nature of the kind of discussion, and everyone has very strong opinions around development processes or particular ways to write a piece of code. So, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of. Uh, but um, I think what I mean is that uh, you want people to develop also as a team and the individuals to develop. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the sort of behaviour that you want to remove from the equation. You don't want that there, so you know that's where maybe the Terminator role comes in. But you'd want to be counselling those people through that sort of behaviour. It's, it's not going to work if you've got that going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking from uh, personal experience, um, the bigger a project becomes, um, the, the chaotic level of it becomes exponential. Um, how do you scale it? Actually, how, how do you scale the self-organizing as aspect of the team? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I think that's something that I, I'd, I would, um, would want to look more at as well. But from my experience with um, the, the Scrum process or even just Agile generally, the bigger a project becomes, the more, uh, the more of a catalyst that is to actually break it out into smaller components and have multiple teams. So you saw on that model that... that um, diagram up there before the concept of in, you know um, interrelated self-organizing teams I think that's um, one way to approach that is that you break it down you don't just have this big amorphous enormous um, team yep Yes. Yes, I think that, and that's a very good point about having um, senior so and junior. Have, have that yeah, that's right. If you have that luxury, because I think that's where that mentoring role comes in as well, and having that balance, um, because it, it does it does require a level of experience. These 
Like, it, it's like we talk about it happening in nature naturally, and that's just a natural occurrence. Well, that's, over, that's millions of years of evolution. Um, this is, this is something that does require process, it does require structure, and there are certain roles that people need to take on. So, but yeah, to your point, yeah, it's very important to have the right mix of people as well in terms of their experience. Yes? Why do people have the Scrum Master training all of them, you said? Well, look, I think that, I think that the, the idea behind that in the first place was that we wanted everybody to, to fundamentally understand the, the ideas behind Scrum and the idea, ideas behind Agile. The concept that I mentioned later, that we thought that we could get anyone in the team to be a Scrum Master, uh, well, that came later. So that wasn't something that we had as our intention when we put everybody on the course. But we just want to make sure that um, that Agile and Scrum is deeply embedded in the culture of our company and um, I think that's really, really important. So even uh, whether or not they end up working on a, on a project, it, we, I mean, we do uh, only put people through currently that actually are um, working actively on the projects, but there'd be no reason not to put somebody even who is just sort of office management staff on the, pro on the course to so that they understand what the... the everybody else is doing, because I think the more it's embedded in the culture of your company, the, the more likely you are to succeed. So you've got two courses well, <laughs> uh, no. Um, but one, actually, one initiative that we're looking at doing is actually putting some of our people through a uh, certified Scrum Master training course, so we'll have our own in-house training capabilities, and that we'll actually be able to have accredited... Uh, um, uh, courses run internally and we're also looking at doing that. I talked about supporting and uh, educating your clients. We're looking at doing that where we run like a product ownership course for our clients. So rather than just saying go off and do this two and a half thousand dollar course before you come back and start the project, we could provide that service to the client and, and, in, and, and then they'll get a much better idea of what their responsibilities are as a product owner. It, look, it's very true, and uh, and I think it was interesting at the business summit yesterday. We got asked to write down what was our biggest issue on our projects, and mine was effective product ownership, because that really does make a huge difference to the quality and the outcome of the project, and that's why we have that kind of uh, very supportive role. Well, we're trying to support our clients in that respect. Well, what do you think? I have a bigger pain spot. Uh, Non-agile executives. Yeah. Yes. They don't care or not aware. No. It's where, when the shit hits the fan and somebody calls them, what's wrong with the website or the product, they will come down and anybody, and, and it can just be one person and the entire uh, rest of the company can be agile, it will still be semi uh, um, yep. scrum or agile and it will fall apart. That's where you need the Terminator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's where that Machiavellian idea comes into it. Where politics can get rid of them eventually. Yeah, but it is the whole idea of that senior management support is really, really important. It's about education, education. Yep. Do you have some tricks to, to educate these people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that there, there probably are tricks and techniques, but I mean, you are going to get people who just they're not interested. They come from a very traditional business background. They're in charge. They're in control. That's all they care about. They don't, you know, somebody's yelling at them if uh, something hasn't gone live. They don't care. How so. about the, the uh, developers, uh, the, the team members, which are really uh, coming from a uh, water for the model and they, they don't want to change their mindset? Uh, is it a, uh, are we doing something really, really wrong if, if it takes a no, look, I think um, just around that, so the concept of um, waterfall uh, experienced developers moving into an agile environment, I think, I think you could e uh, make that transition easier by uh, doing uh, better requirements uh, and better story development, better um, uh, engagement with the client. Because if you provide any developer with a, uh, a really strong requirement, with a great set of acceptance criteria or whatever you, you want to call them in, in that context, 
I think they'll all get on board eventually. It's just uh, they're used to m maybe having a you know spec this big and they just go away and you know do what they do to get it done. Um, if you, you sort of do that more iteratively with them and provide them with good information, I think that you you know you find you get them on board eventually, as well as as well as some training. Yeah. That, well, that's right. I think that's. Well, allowing, allowing, we, I mean, all of our de developers have full contact with the client on, on a daily basis. So I think that's a really, really good thing to encourage. And I think that, I think people would enjoy that coming from that background where they were just hidden away in a corner from the client. That closer contact, I think, would be really helpful. No, I've, absolutely. And that's, yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and I would say one to six months, uh, a six to eight person team working on uh, performing, if you yep. call it performing, performing, performing. Yeah. Um, and I would say the healthy team is the one who's actually determining. Yep. Asking the scrum master or the product owner or the CEO to get this guy out or yes. out uh, because we've tried everything and it's, it's just not. Well, it's a self-organising Terminator team. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Appreciate it.